to give a brief brief background of the stock uh, at fifthel we have created a new track to focus on digital infrastructures essentially uh, giant architectures that are being built uh, whether it could be in the public space or even in the private space that are data trust that are information systems and this whole business vertical of information has ballooned over the last 5 years so we are trying to bring in computing principles on how these systems need to be built to ensure that individuals have control over their data and this series essentially focuses on talking about issues like consent privacy differential privacy uh, encryptions like uh, new analytical systems which are privacy safe where people are not invading someone's private space but are still using their information to do analyze systems so part of this series we have anand venkat narayanan who is going to be talking about consent and essentially he is going to show us how cryptography is important for building information infrastructures and he is going to look at how the digital locker system could have ideally been built by comparing it with amazon s3 and also he is going to touch a bit on differential privacy anand venkatnaran nan is a industry veteran in the space of cyber security he has been working he has been involved in a lot of reviews of existing digital infrastructures for the past 3 years and he is going to share some of his learnings with us today anand over to you okay uh thank you everyone um um i just want to basically give a overview on what this talk is about uh i will try to finish it as much as possible within 40 minutes so this is essentially the break up uh the first 5 minutes Uh, we are going to try to finish uh, just a very top level introduction on digital infrastructure uh, then we are going to go uh, over how the use of crypto has evolved in uh, digital infrastructures and um, and how the last the last bit is uh, specific on how uh, crypto and consent are pretty much related to each other uh, that's basically how the flow of the uh, talk is going to be right uh so the first part is this um so now most of us are aware of the fact what uh, infrastructure means uh, but on the physical side uh, so i would not go over it but the fact is that it is like a base layer on which everything is built uh, so in the real world you can think of like hospitals ports transports uh, people call them as uh, infrastructure but they are on the physical realm and uh, the same thing uh, applies uh, even on the financial side so for instance people may come back and uh, talk to you about uh, there is a central bank there is a commercial bank and there is an atm switch there is npci and there is a whole bunch of uh, routing protocols and so on and so on uh, so these are also what we call as uh, examples of infrastructure uh, but on the financial side and um, uh, you can apply the same concept uh, and paradigm on the digital space and you can you can say that what exactly is digital infrastructure um so you can think of <clears throat> how uh, digital infrastructure as a con concept itself is like barely 5 6 years old and uh, but it has been around for a while uh, so you can think of how uh, amazon when when they came up the aws stuff uh, there were a lot of uh, things that came in initially Uh, when they said we are offering infrastructure as a service, I mean, why rent service? Why rent hardware? Why rent switches? Why buy switches? We just going to offer you infrastructure as it is, and uh, that they used to call as infrastructure as a service. Uh, then what companies started doing was uh, they off started offering software services on top of that, and they said, oh, this is software as a service. And then there is uh, nowadays this whole concept about platform as a service, uh, which is like this is the entire thing, take it, do whatever you want. Uh, so you can see the iteration uh, levels uh, are exceptionally fast in this area uh, but having said that it is still digital infrastructure in the sense that these are things that are so basic that uh, they just power a lot of these systems and you just have to understand that they are almost in the same realm of, of physical infrastructure okay uh, so what exactly is digital infrastructure 
so you can think about digital infrastructure in a very broad way uh, by saying that they are not any different and, and fundamentally same as uh, information processing infrastructures. Uh, that is what they are. They just process a lots and lots and lots of information. And they provide all the framework tools and the platforms to crunch uh, and emit data. But that's basically what they are, right? And so if you look at uh, any infrastructure uh, or some kind of a universe, you talk about what are the atomic operations uh, that you would typically find uh, in this universe. Uh, so in the information infrastructure, you would, you would actually have only three uh, macro operations. Uh, they are, and they're all very uh, related and cyclic to each other. Uh, that is what we call as a store, create, analyze uh, loop. In the sense that you just create one and then the other and then the other and it spins faster and faster and it creates more of itself. Uh, so these are basically what we call as the atomic operations uh, in the dataverse world. Okay. Um, uh, so then uh, I'm going to go over a bit uh, and uh, trace down uh, the evolution of how uh, the atomic operations of this infrastructure work and also try to place uh, crypto uh, evolution into these uh, infrastructures. Okay. Um, so if you go back and look at the previous one, uh, we talked about what is called as uh, store created process. And uh, you just have to go back to March 2006 uh, and, and trace back what S3 did, right? And it, it is a newer kind of a data storage. And uh, it basically came back and said, look, uh, you can store a lot of data uh, in an infrastructure that we have built for you. You don't have to basically create this infrastructure yourself, but you can just use and rent and uh, uh, for yourself. That's basically what they said uh, on March 2006, when they said, here is a new kind of uh, data storage. Okay. And slightly later on August 2006, they introduced what we call as the processing layer. And they said, well, we have this stuff called EC2. Uh, uh, you can, uh, do whatever computing you want, you can rent it out, you can do information that you had stored on S3. That's basically what uh, the initial pitch uh, was about Amazon EC2. Okay. And on August 2008, which is three years from when they started uh, the entire notion of uh, uh, on-rent available digital infrastructure, they said you can bring your own data and uh, and the primary motivation for that is, while well, S3 is a new kind of storage, the existing storage was all based on um, hard disks. And uh, uh, NFS used to be pretty popular then, it's, it's somewhat less popular now, but even then. Uh, so what they basically said is, look, uh, if all you have is information, you can just bring the information uh, in block storage and we have it here. And so that's EBS, okay. And so if you look at what, how this entire thing maps uh, back, to the atomic operations in the universe. Uh, so EBS and S3 belong to the store part and creating more information, analyzing them uh, belong to the EC2 compute part. That's basically what they have done uh, so far until 2008, okay? And uh, you look back again, what they did, I mean, this is again public information, uh, a pretty much a very small operation. The infrastructure is not fantastic or great and it's still evolving, right? And on 2011, which is, Five years later, after they launched S3, uh, they brought in something very interesting. Uh, it is called what uh, in crypto we call as bring your own keys. Okay. Uh, so historically, if you look at uh, the public digital infrastructure evolution, uh, it's basically about, uh, well, there is data and you can store it, but don't ask for encryption. So the initial version of the S3 was all about what we call as client encryption. Uh, which is, uh, you want to store something, you're worried about security, you just encrypt yourself and uh, push it to the uh, push it to the blob. That's basically how it used to work. Uh, now, obviously, that is not something that is uh, very scalable and doable. And uh, there have been a lot of uh, feedback about, uh, well, we wanted it on your side, but not on my side. Uh, so what they actually did on 2011, uh, which is five years later after they started S3, uh, was uh, by saying, uh, well, uh, server-side encryption is there and we're gonna allow you to do what you wanna do. And so the, the interesting point here is, uh, is that what it allowed is when you, when you, did a, when you do a put operation on an SD bucket, uh, you can just basically specify uh, your 
AES256 key. That's basically what it's all about. Okay. Um, uh, then came EBS encryption. Uh, this is saying that, well, you have a hard disk and you have a lot of data in the hard disk. And uh, here is another encryption layer for storing EBS okay, uh, on that. And uh, again, you go back and look at what they did during this time, 2014. Uh, they introduced full-fledged key management. Uh, and and the, there is a primary reason uh, for key management, uh, the introduction of key management in general, uh, because no matter what you do about uh, keys, uh, whether they are public or private or symmetric or asymmetric, uh, for, key management is always a bit of a pain. So people basically said, well, you're offering encryption, but where is the key management? And uh, it used to be offloaded uh, to the users at one point of time. Uh, so it came back uh, and said, well, we're offering you key management as a service. And once they offered key management as a service, uh, they allowed only three services, as you can see, which were uh, the most uh, popular then, uh, which was EBS, S3, and Redshift. Uh, so these are these three services together, uh, and the key management is what really uh, changed the game by saying we are extremely serious players. Okay, uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's the way we try to read this. Okay, and then came the part uh, and they said well uh, not only we can manage uh, your key cycle key life cycle uh, encryption key life cycle you can also bring your own keys with the key management service uh, so this is all done uh, from 2006 when they started to 2016 in about 10 year evolution you look at it uh, they basically are practically done uh, with inventing uh, encryption keys and management for uh, millions of companies and corporations right that's the evolution of how a public digital infrastructure, even though uh, we call it public, it's still privately owned, uh, morphed itself from uh, an organization that just sold books to doing what it does today. Okay. That's the evolution of uh, the crypto part. So now what it really meant is it fundamentally changed the game uh, to do something like this. Mm. So in the earlier model, when we started off, uh, we basically said uh, it's all they do is analyze, create, and store. Uh, but by doing all these changes, uh, even though none of the changes were uh, uh, there about 10 years ago when they started off, over a slow period of time, they brought in uh, the middle layer, which is crypto, and kind of embedded uh, it into almost every service you can think of. Right. So in a way, uh, if you are looking at an evolution of how digital infrastructure that everyone uses work, uh, this is how it looks today. Right. And so what they basically did was they said, well, uh, there are a lot of services that create data. There are a lot of services that analyze data. There are a lot of services that store data. And so this is the uh, uh, cycle uh, which kind of powered uh, Amazon uh, into uh, what it does today. Uh, right. Okay, uh, the, the interesting uh, part uh, in this whole thing uh, is, is all about why did they do what they did, right? And uh, it is important to put some historical context into why did they did what they did uh, in terms of why it's so important. Um, uh, the, the basic idea that we had always uh, uh, followed uh, in the physical world uh, is about control. Like for instance, you can just draw a small uh, hedge around your house. You can just put maybe a wall, uh, 13 feet walls are pretty popular in India. Um, and so you can just basically come back and say uh, that, well, I've drawn a big wall uh, around my place and I've secured whatever and no one can come in. Uh, there is armed security guards and so on and so on. Uh, but, but in reality, uh, this is actually confusing uh, storage uh, with ownership and with control. Uh, so in, in the dataverse, uh, these three things are, are very different things. Uh, uh, what, what, we mean, what we mean by saying that these three things are very different things uh, is that it really doesn't matter where you store your data. Uh, it really matters who has control over it. When we say control, it's about uh, can you and see what is in it? That's really what we mean by control. Can you change what is in it? That's really what, what we mean by control. So the fundamental uh, control operations uh, with respect to data are, are read and write. And if you have control over that, and I think it means that it really doesn't matter uh, whether uh, you're storing it in your hard disk or whether you're storing it in your neighbor's house. And uh, so that's really the uh, a breakup of 
uh, how the industry works. In the sense that in the past, most of it is all stored in a single organization with a fixed perimeter. Uh, those perimeters are now gone. Okay. And uh, when those perimeters are gone, the only way in which you can kind of say that I'm still in control of what I store is crypto. And that comes because of the control part. And that is why uh, it is important to basically navigate and I'll show you how uh, the SB and Amazon uh, folks evolved into what they are doing, because they could not have done what they have done uh, if they had if they had not recognized this fundamental fact and added crypto as the layer uh, in the middle, which kind of hooked up into all the services. Yeah, right. And so what it really means uh, is that uh, when you basically uh, take out what is all in one place, uh, which is data, and then it's, it's always in your pocket, you, had, uh, you have control, you had ownership, it is also stored uh, in the machines that you control uh, uh, and uh, do whatever you want with it. What this fundamentally means uh, is that uh, you had a lot of trust on whatever you had built, but the moment you disaggregate it and put it across in uh, various different places, uh, what you actually have got uh, is distrust. So what this means is that we have a very nice term for it. Uh, uh, it's called an emergent property in the sense that the property emerges out of complicated interactions among these three vectors. Okay, so that's, that's really what we mean by uh, saying in uh, emergent property. And uh, uh, how does this emergent property uh, impact business and impact uh, everyone else is because if uh, it, it presents a big problem in a sense in the sense that if you're if you are good in processing data and let's say you have a very uh, aml company you are doing something and uh, it's not your job to run uh, storage it's just not your job to run compute servers your job is to run a whole bunch of algorithms and that's what you're good at so this is basically saying that, look, if you're good at one thing, you just focus on one thing, but allow other, I mean, leverage other players that are good at other things to use it. And so the, the hard problem with the whole thing is, I mean, all of a sudden it is a data processing system. And so how do you ensure that the other guy is not, uh, you know, taking out your data and doing, it, doing their own thing, which is one of the things that people always had about AWS. Uh, so the only way in which you can do that is by doing encryption. And so, and that's basically the distrust part that comes in. Yeah. Uh, so the way in which uh, they had solved this entire problem is by, by, is by saying that, look, uh, I know you don't trust us. I mean, it's still, you are free uh, to store it uh, the way in which you want, uh, if you trust us, but let us say you don't. So we are offering you all this uh, wonderful uh, mediation services that kind of turns this trust into somewhat a limited amount of trust. And, and so that's the job of, of crypto. So if you if you understand the uh, if you understand uh, how the talk has gone so far, it's it's fundamentally about a lot of players uh, with a lot of their own uh, problems and their own opinions and uh, trying to maximize uh, a value uh, about an infrastructure that one player has built, even though you don't necessarily trust the player. Uh, this is basically the interplay of all these forces. And uh, you, the only way in which you can build that uh, is by uh, building a technology layer uh, to some level and say that, yeah, this is how it is. Uh, we are mediating all these parties, different concerns uh, by uh, creating this layer called crypto. That's, that's the evolutionary path. Uh, if you look at most of the public platforms that you see today, which are gigantic and used by many uh, have taken, uh, particularly uh, when there is a free market uh, or there's a market force which says that, it's not mandated. You're not mandated uh, by a government holding a gun on your head to use that, but it's just basically free market playing it out with various parties having their own opinions and how uh, your market evolved. That's basically the, uh, the trend that you have seen so far, right? And, and so far we have talked about the enterprise space, right? And uh, this is a space that is uh, typically dominated by uh, businesses. And uh, in this space, uh, yeah, sure, crypto key management used to be a hard problem, but uh, well, uh, we have just shown how it uh, got resolved over a period of time uh, on, on the enterprise space. But uh, having said that, in the past, one of the reasons why crypto is not really used a lot is because we always have a problem with crypto keys. Uh, how, how do you manage? What's the life cycle? Who, what gets rotated? What gets recycled? And so on and so on. And so this is one of the reasons why it was not used a lot before. And whoever has used 
uh, a lot before uh, where people who could afford it, uh, right? And but this is really not the case anymore. On twenty twenty, I mean that's that's the reality that we have seen uh, all along. Uh, you can see how uh, AWS built the key management uh, solution called KMS. Uh, you can see how Google Cloud built their own, uh, you know, key management systems, uh, and you can see how HashiCorp uh, built their own vault for uh, solution for recycling keys. I mean, the vault does nothing but store and manage secrets. It's it's all about lifecycle managing of your keys, right? And so this is one part of the enterprise side. But if you look at it, uh, something interesting has also happening on the retail side. Uh, you have these two players. Uh, you have a lot of these password managers, LastPass, OnePassword, Bitwarden, uh, who have been trying to do uh, in in reality secrets management, uh, which I which I call as a kind of key. I mean, a password is just kind of a key uh, for for the retail folks. I mean, uh, people like you and me. And uh, if you look at what they've actually done, uh, is that uh, in the past, if you had ever seen a UX of a product that does key management at the retail side, it's kind of very demanding. Like the GPG instance, you just had to basically create, write a command, do open SSL, uh, you know, key create and copy it over, then embed it in some fold, I mean, folder, and then do a whole bunch of things. None of this uh, you would see in the modern password managers. In fact, the, in fact, what they've actually done uh, is that they have simplified the UX to a large level. Um, and say that all you have to remember is just one password, okay, which is the master password, and that's about it. So if you if you look at what they've actually done on the background is that uh, they use a, a PKDBF uh, to or, or or a whole bunch of algorithms around it, and, and they generate a AES two fifty six key, and that key is uh, then encrypted using this password, and that key is then uh, used for storing other passwords and so on and so on. Uh, so, the, so, and it is kind of uh, also interesting uh, what Bitwarden did in a sense that they said, well, this is all our crypto and it is open source. You can go look at it and uh, it's fully API compatible. Uh, so, so in general, you can see an explosion of these solutions, uh, just not on the enterprise side, uh, but also on the consumer side. And uh, the typical uh, cybersecurity advice that everyone gives it to their dad uh, and their dog nowadays is, well, just store it on a password manager. I mean, whether it is paid or unpaid, that's a debatable thing, but that's basically where uh, the trend so far uh, has looked, right? Okay, and here is the other interesting example. Um, uh, from where key management used to be a very arcane exercise, uh, but we're also seeing an instance of e encryption uh, where uh, we know for a fact uh, that uh, WhatsApp uses E2E. We, we know for a fact that the protocol is pretty complicated. And we also know that most of it is so seamless that people don't even understand uh, that on an average, uh, how many keys uh, they manage uh, when they talk to uh, their family members using WhatsApp, right? I mean, uh, so this is, this is the signal protocols, uh, DH ratchet algorithms uh, that they use. And uh, you can see those red lines I mean, the red boxes, uh, I, I will not go much deep into explaining uh, every one of that, uh, but you can just see how many keys they are. I mean, the ones that are ending with Ks are keys, right? So there is RK, there is CK, there is root keys, and then there is a chain key, and then there is how all of them are rotated, ratcheted, back and forth. All of this done in such a transparent manner that none of the people here don't even know about uh, they're doing key management uh, with WhatsApp. I mean, so, so we have seen a historical trend uh, just suddenly reversing uh, very fast in a span of like three or four years. Okay, so that's basically the thing that you have to look at it and say, wow, uh, am I exchanging 100 keys a day? I mean, the answer is yes, right? And the other interesting thing about uh, these crypto and the storage and all the information stacks uh, are uh, that uh, most of them are open source. Uh, for instance, uh, you take S3 for an example, uh, you can add, uh, the S3 protocol is kind of uh, well known, it kind of became de facto. Uh, so there are quite a few players there uh, who provide uh, uh, their own version of S3, um, in the sense that you can just take the AWS CLI and uh, the AWS services and uh, just change the endpoint. 
and uh, from s3 dot something amazon aws dot com to xyz dot com uh, and it kind of works seamlessly uh, so i know for a fact that uh, uh, some of them also offer uh, high encryption uh, double encryption uh, so one of the players who does this is minio uh, so you can just go and look at uh, minio uh, the bin i m i n i o and they offer quite a bit uh, on top of s3 and uh, it's natively compatible it has a whole bunch of uh, use cases which are remarkably uh, uh, different right uh, compared to what s3 can offer uh, then there is also this stuff about uh, cif and gluster and zfs and so on and so on so all of them offer encryption all of them offer encryption natively and uh, uh, so then the question that you really have to ask is if they are open source and if they offer crypto and they offer all of this for free i mean how the hell do they make money uh, the answer of course is that they're pretty good in what they're doing which is efficiency of i mean optionality and trust uh, so this is this is basically the uh, lay of the land um, i mean we just look at it, what happened in the last 2 3 years that's basically where it is yeah all right uh, we're now uh, moving to the third uh, part of the talk i mean hopefully i'm still on time I can, yeah, sure. I'm almost on time. Uh, the third part of the talk, uh, which is about uh, uh, a digital public locker. Uh, I mean, as it stands in India, and how it compares with some of the stuff that uh, we have been talking about. Yeah, I mean, uh, so uh, the digital, uh, the public locker as a concept itself is not a very strange thing. Uh, we've been uh, using them from. time memorial ever since uh, the railways uh, introduced this thing called cloak rooms uh, so what you do in the cloak room is uh, you just basically go to a place you just store your stuff and uh, extra luggages and you just come back and pick them up and usually these public cloak rooms in india uh, offer their own lock and keys but you're also free to bring your own lock and key which is what uh, i mean my parents used to do ever since when i was young like 25 years ago they used to carry their own uh, you know Uh, lock and keys so what it offers uh, is this which is you get storage you get you get safe storage uh, where you may probably not get to walk up about things and you also bring you know take your own lock and key uh, so this is uh, the public uh, locker uh, as a construct in india and it's been there for a very very long time yeah and then uh, you also have bank lockers as an example and if you notice any uh, bank lockers you would always notice that there are actually two keys uh, the one key is with the banker the next key is with you and of course you're not allowed to bring your own lock because it's just too complicated to operate right uh, so the the base idea here uh, is that uh, is a very simple thing i mean why do you basically uh, not have one key and just give it to the uh, uh, banker or why do you not have uh, just one key and just leave it to the owner uh this is again very it's not very uh, complex to say what it is i mean if you have only one key uh, to your bank locker you're worried the banker would steal it uh, and uh, the banker is worried that if you only have one key to his locker and um, you may probably uh, lose it somewhere so 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 the base idea is that uh, you just need two people uh, to basically open the lock uh, unless until you get a locksmith to just basically bar it apart Uh, so that's the essence uh, even of the bank locker in the sense that there is a trust factor involved and they kind of said we will we will uh, solve the trust factor by doing a key partition uh, which is a cryptographic term by saying oh, there is a key and it is just divided into two two people and only when both of them apply at the same time uh, it kind of works so so the uh, the problem uh, is kind of universal in the sense that there is public early available stuff i mean even on the page stuff like bank locker there is a trust problem Uh, and you solve the trust problem uh, using either bring your own lock and keys or do partition keys, where you just strip the same key across different people and then use it. Right <laughs> now, the most uh, interesting thing that you would see uh, in India uh, in most of the public digital infrastructure, uh, which I call digital locker as an example, uh, is that it lacks this idea uh, about bring your own keys. Okay. uh and uh, why is that right uh so here is the here is the problem that uh, typically people uh, tend to have i mean uh, would you lose your uh, encryption key then what happens uh, so in the case of uh, bitwarden and all that kind of stuff right i mean it's a risk that you take 
in the sense that uh, you 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 lose an encryption key uh, well i'm sorry uh, it's done i mean there is nothing much you can do about it uh, so people typically tend to have some kind of uh, backups like even in aws if you if you lose some of the cmks the master keys you're done i mean what can you do about it uh, so that is the crux of the problem and the crux of the problem is, look, if you lose the encryption key, you're done. So you're just going to store it uh, in someone else's place without uh, having an encryption key. And so what it really means is, and, and what it really means is that uh, you, you, you actually lose control of it. I mean, uh, literally speaking. And uh, well, we can also argue about the fact that, look, you are, uh, you sometimes want to store with encryption, but you also want to share information. Uh, so how do you actually, uh, I mean, do both of it, right? Uh, so then uh, the, the, the overall ground in India is let's not do crypto, let's just create digital artifact which prove that you consented to share. But what uses consent when the information that you're shared is, is, is the third party? And uh, you just basically create a legal fiction by saying that, look, I'm giving it to you for this purpose and you're not supposed to use it for any other purpose. A classical example is when you just take a Xerox copy of your ID card and you say, for the purpose of this, I mean, who even gives about it? I mean, I mean, you can use it for whatever, but someone can always do something else. Uh, but then the question then is, uh, if this is a problem uh, that existed, uh, how do you actually solve this problem uh, in, in an alternate reality? Uh, is it even a solvable problem? Uh, so how do you go about doing it? Because you, you, on one hand, we're seeing we want encryption uh, on, on, on storage using bring your own keys. On the other hand, you're also saying that we want to share information. So, so how do you basically, uh, you know, bridge these two two different problems, right? Uh, so, uh, uh, we have quite a few schemes, and uh, some of those schemes uh, are interesting because on the cryptography side, uh, they they are interesting mathematical properties. Uh, so, for instance, uh, the the typical way in which people think about encryption. Uh, is that it's an all or nothing uh, by saying that it's either you encrypt uh, or you don't encrypt. Uh, but that is not how uh, uh, in reality things work. Uh, we also have a different class of algorithms uh, called as the property preserving encryption algorithms, uh, which fundamentally says that, look, uh, if uh, they preserve property among texts, for instance, uh, let's say you have a plain text A, uh, say number, uh, it says 25. And then you have another plain text B, which is another number, 50. And uh, the, the relationship between these two numbers is 25 is, of course, uh, less than 50. Then what you do is you encrypt number 25 using an algorithm, and you encrypt uh, number 50 using another algorithm. Uh, the same property still works uh, for uh, the encrypted 25 and encrypted 50. Uh, so that is what is called property preserving. In a sense that uh, if you normally apply encryption, uh, the standard AES 256 uh, encryption on both the plain text, uh, you can't make sense out of this. I mean, there is no guarantee about the uh, operator property being preserved. But on the contrary, if you're using a PPE, uh, then uh, you basically get the property preserved. Uh, so what it really means is that uh, you have a class of algorithms that preserves a class of properties. Uh, some class of algorithm preserve uh, uh, less than some proper, some class preserves equivalent, some class preserves greater than, some class preserves a bit of both, and so on and so on. So what it, what it really offers you is that it offers uh, you a trade-off between uh, information leakage uh, by giving up some privacy versus, uh, versus the convenience of sharing without an all or nothing deal. Uh, but having said that, remember, uh, you're still making some privacy losses uh, because it's amenable to uh, repeated queries, but it is still better than uh, what I would say um, is share everything model with no encryption. That's basically how you create PPEs as, yeah. And the, the place where PPEs get very interesting uh, is when you have a big document, uh, which you can strip it up uh, into end fields. Uh, let's say you have some kind of an array document, uh, which has some secret ID, or it could be your uh, PAN number, or it could be your tax, uh, I mean, or PF, whatever. I mean, it's a secret ID which you don't want to share. And then uh, you have name and date of birth and address, which are three other fields, which uh, you're okay somewhat to share. So what you can actually do with PPE is you can apply differential encryption on this document uh, uh, 
on these different fields. So you can basically come back and say, nah, well, I want to apply, I want to share some information about myself to do something, but I will apply full encryption on the secret ID because that is something that I don't want people to know about. And uh, name, I don't care. So no encryption on it. And uh, well, date of birth, I don't want to share, but I'm okay uh, to share a number which says, uh, uh, what's my age, right? Uh, so, so then you can apply a P you can apply a transformation on the date of birth, and then you can come back and say, well, then I would apply a PP algorithm on the age part, and then on address you can choose anything. So, so, so what is what this really means is that you don't have to treat encryption uh, as an all or nothing thing. I mean, that's fantastic. You can just basically you have a lot of little knobs on whatever you want to share on a particular document. You can just pick and choose what you want based on what you think is appropriate for you. Uh, so that what it what it what it really means, right? I mean, so you you come back and ask what does PPA really offers then? Uh, is that it offers what we call as informational self determination in the sense that you, the sharer, uh, you know, has a lot of control on what is being shared, how it is being shared, and also determine the PP uh, and the encryption algorithm. Okay. Um, uh, and as, as you can see, it is also composable. So when you say composable, it means you can keep applying transformations uh, on some of the fields and then apply PT on top of it. So that is one thing. Uh, so then, so this is basically the broad spectrum thing of what PT offers, right? Uh, and uh, is everything fantastic then with PPE? Uh, no, they're not, right? Uh, so this is basically, uh, people have been getting, uh, People have been trying to use the PPE model uh, on health records, uh, which of course is, uh, is something that is happening in India with the, with, with the national health stack and uh, all the other stuff. Uh, so the base problem with health records has always been that, look, what is that you're sharing? Uh, I mean, epidemiolo epidemiologists and all the other guys want a lot of information uh, about people uh, and health records in order to do a lot of effective health, uh, public health management. Uh, so what happens if you apply a PP on those records and they actually run an experiment on it with various record types and how it is. Um, so what you see here is uh, the auxiliary attribute, which is, I mean, imagine a health record where you had a column called primary payer and, uh, and what they try to do is uh, they try to extract this attribute uh, using a PPE, uh, I mean, and this, this, these uh, attributes were uh, encrypted using PPEs and they try to extract it uh, using an extraction attack, which is, which is all about repeated querying. Uh, there's a whole MATLAB uh, attack you can do on that um, with PPEs and all. So the accuracy part uh, merely shows that the higher the accuracy, the, the more they're able to extract information back uh, to the plain text. That's what it really means, even though it is PPE. Uh, so it requires an attack model. The attack model fundamentally is about repeat queries. You have a lot of time to do and so on and so on. And uh, so you can just see uh, uh, the patient died. It's like a yes or no. So you get lots of uh, good hits with booleans. Uh, it gets harder and harder with numbers uh, and so on and so on. So that's basically the extraction attack stuff on PPEs. Uh, you can do, I, this also tells you about the other interesting part, which is uh, the other attributes and the time uh, it, it took them to basically figure out what is the actual value by combining with other things. So, but having said all this, you just have to look at it and say, well, is this good enough for you? The answer is, well, it is probably better than what you have today. That's, that, is how, that is how you do it. Right? The, the next part, which is what we would be covering uh, is on differential privacy. Uh, so what does differential privacy really mean uh, is that uh, it basically allows you to retain your privacy, uh, even though uh, statistical, by the of a statistical database, uh, people can figure out uh, the information of people who contributed to it. Okay. Uh, so for instance, uh, so think about this very differently, right? Uh, so there is a statistical database of a, a PII. Uh, personal identifiable information, which had name, age, sex, marriage date, uh, and so on and so on. And so someone basically uh, drew and, and wrote down uh, aggregate statistics from the information from the database and just released it on the public domain uh, for whatever reason. And the key question then is, can you reconstruct the aggregate information uh, uh, the, from the information and re reconstruct it to the actual person? 
uh, that is that is what we are interested interested in right uh, so an example of uh, so it's, it, we call it e differential sigma differential is because it merely says that look if you had never been in a database you had suffered no privacy harm but on the contrary if you had been in it assume that nothing released what is that we have to you know aspire for so you have to aspire for releasing a statistical data set which is useful for public data and public health but should not release any private information so that's basically the end goal so the end goal of uh, differential privacy is is almost the same privacy as individual as if the data is not a database that's basically the uh, end goal of differential privacy so this is another uh, very interesting area of research that is coming up right and we have lots of uh, real world uh, use cases uh, where this has been successfully applied uh, so one of it is windows telemetry uh, so if you look at what windows telemetry is that it just keeps sending you data back to microsoft uh, uh, to to figure out what has happening in a device and are you being in a threat attack i mean and so on and so on uh, so so the question then is uh, can you really re release a lot of personal information by looking at it if microsoft got leaked i mean got hacked so that is one way of uh, so that is a problem they try to uh, solve by uh, in the differential privacy uh, so the, the the next thing was linkedin adwords queries i mean this is also where uh, you want a service to that to to target but you don't want their advisor to know the specific names and addresses of people so how do you do it uh, the last thing is interesting uh, which is the us census for commuting patterns okay uh, so these are there are more examples than than what i had done but uh, this is just to say that these algorithms exist and it kind of works yeah uh, so this is an example of what we call as a deconstruction problem in the us census so what they actually did was uh, they collected data uh, from people about their age sex race and relationship and then they created the statistical table and released it to the public domain on the left side uh, so if you want to reconstruct it back to the right side you just need a, a set of you just need to solve a set of 164 equations um and so solving those equations takes 0.2 seconds on a 27 macro pro so this is basically what uh the problem differential privacy is supposed to solve that you should not be able to reconstruct the right hand side from the left hand side yeah okay so what they actually do by saying is that uh, they basically inject random noise uh into the uh data and hence try to preserve your privacy okay so what it really means is that uh, you basically have a sliding uh, kind of a slider which says that well if you want complete privacy the day the aggregated data is useless but if you want slightly less privacy then this is basically the amount of information uh, uh, injection that we will do to make it slightly useless and so on uh, so that is so this slider is 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 the best way to think about what uh, differential privacy does so so in in so what we have done so far uh, in this whole uh, construct i mean by bringing this together what's the theoretical framework that you have to really think about uh, when we talk about public uh, digital infrastructures uh, is that uh, a uh, they're extremely useful things i mean who wouldn't want an infrastructure in a modern country which which has roads rails and transports and hospitals and i think the same uh, construct works for uh, even for digital infrastructures who wouldn't want a digital infrastructure uh, but the, the 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 point of course is that that you have to build them very carefully uh, and uh, the way we sort of think them if if you don't build them very carefully uh, then you suffer a lot of uh, these problems right and and uh, one way in which you can uh, think about how you have to build them very carefully is how uh, the other public digital infrastructures evolve uh, where you keep uh, crypto uh, i mean as a core layer uh, you build a whole bunch of storage management around that and then you basically build privacy services around it um and then utility layers it could be public health data whatever you want uh, so so the base idea is that if you if you are doing a lot of aggregated data uh, you have to think about uh, doing stuff like differential privacy uh, if you are doing a lot of personal data i think you have to think about bringing your own key management and you have to rethink about how people interact and by rethinking how people interact you actually create trust in the system which basically increases the accuracy of data that you are building uh, so so the way in which i can think about the way in which i think about this is what i call as privacy pie in the sense that uh, everyone has to share data and uh, everyone needs to contribute uh, to some extent to how decisions are made in a country and uh, but it also has to be done in a form that creates trust but uh, but not like a legal fiction 
And the way in which you have to create the trust is by rethinking about uh, crypto and uh, all this information uh, and all the privacy uh, stuff that uh, is modern uh, coming like the differential privacy schemes. Okay, we're almost there. Uh, so if you have ever read that uh, nice book about uh, privacy 3.0, uh, which is written by Rahul Martin, I mean, I would still go and uh, urge you to read it. It's a quite a nice book. Okay. Uh, so most of the arguments about the book um, is about, oh, well, there is consent, there is broken, and how do you rebuild it, and so on and so on. Uh, but if you actually notice, uh, there is actually a way, uh, the solution for consent broken is a problem that is there on the, is on the, is on the cover of the book itself, uh, which is what I call bring your own encryption keys. Yeah. And just bringing this into the picture uh, and uh, bringing uh, your own encryption algorithms and how you interact with these systems uh, kind of work very, uh, you know, uh, go a very long way into, uh, into how you can rethink and reimagine about uh, public infrastructure. Yeah. Like I'm done exactly for now. Uh, I, thank you, Anand. I think that was interesting, a uh, very set of perspectives. Before we open up for questions, uh, I think if people have questions, they can type in the Q&A or if you're watching it on YouTube or as well, please go, either go to the comment section and ask them or even ask it in the chat windows, whether you are doing it. Uh, but I have a question before some of these people ask uh, you for questions pertaining to this clearly uh, these are uh, whatever you have said is essentially a mathematical issue right like you you boiled a social issue of privacy or uh, the infrastructure issue which is an engineering thing all of it to a mathematical problem at some levels uh, so for people to determine what model to be used uh, these things need to be calculated or modeled. And when you talk about, say, sensors, for example, the US Census Bureau is looking at it. And same way, I guess, the India's uh, Register General of India is supposed to be doing some of this. Uh, you have a proposition by saying that these things need to be happening in a certain way, which enables trust. But at the same time, people have to share data uh, to ensure that they some policy decisions need to happen. There can't be a scenario where people can, cannot say that, oh, we won't be sharing any data. That could be a serious loss in scenarios like the corona pandemic itself, where you are required to share your information at some level, especially your health information, if it is harming someone else. Now, how do you even take this forward? Say, who should be the authority who should be looking at this at a larger level because considering the problem of technology in itself or how engineering is done is different in different um, ministries or different in different departments uh, can can do you think all of this can be simplified by building a separate digital infrastructure itself again when i ask that is there a need for it who determines the need for it uh, well, I think it's, I mean, who determines the need for it? I mean, I, I, I don't know how to answer the other question, but I can answer the last two questions, which is, is there a need for it? I mean, hell yes, sure. Uh, you just look at what happened uh, when people uh, uh, were asked to do, uh, share information with the ROGC. To, like, I mean, I personally tracked about 15 knots, right? Uh, HuffPost wrote an article about it. Uh, so, so the base problem uh, clearly is that that people are not comfortable sharing, and uh, it could be because of the fact that they've been asked to share more. Maybe the thing is not utilized. I mean, useful, whatever. Uh, so definitely, there is a need for it, and the need for it is is about public trust, right? And uh, there has to be a lot of informed decision making on on the public side to say that look, I'm comfortable sharing my uh, Bluetooth trace information, but not my location. Yeah. And I'm comfortable sharing uh, my uh, Bluetooth information only if it falls within these parameters. So you just turn around the question and ask, 
Why would you not share? Uh, the trust problem keeps coming back, which is not any different than what Amazon faced when they started off, right? So you have to come back and say, look, I'm giving you all the tools that allow you agency uh, as a citizen of this country uh, who's involved uh, in in certain way uh, in the country's functioning uh, to say, well, you choose. And these are ways in which you have, and you just basically empower people, and then maybe it'll work. I mean, this is basically what I can think of. Uh, as to uh, the last question you said about, uh, is there a need for it? Yeah, I mean, should we, who's gonna do it? I don't know. I mean, I think someone has to do it. Uh, it would be far better uh, if the government follows the uh, public consulting approach for doing this rather than just doing what they're doing. That's all I can think of. Uh, okay, uh, do we have any questions? Uh, I guess some of you here might have questions. I don't see any of them here, but. Uh, anyone? Sorry, we are collecting some questions. But... Okay? There is one hand raised over yeah. here. She can't. Uh, okay. Hey, she can't. You can talk now. You can unmute yourself. Hey, Shina. So I just had a quick comment to make on uh, the locker analogy and uh, the digital locker in particular. So firstly, uh, with the locker, uh, with digital locker, I would say uh, is it's about uh, data sharing from a set of trusted entities to another set of trusted entities where your information is uh, aggregated by this intermediary to share uh, trusted information about you. And that's not information that you determined yourself. It's basically your bank statements or your uh, whatever, your uh, even your Aadhaar card, but that's, the data that's there is from the authority. So what uh, this infrastructure is for is basically instead of trusting like 1 billion people, the, the FinTech company can now trust say a set of 100 banks and another set of 30 government agencies and say that, okay, I need, not, I need to ask you for say your salary statements or whatever for, to give you a loan, but I don't trust you when you come and say, this is my salary slip because you can just fake a paper and say this is salary slip. So I would want the bank statement to be made and I would want that to be digitally made via digital locker because even you know, bank statement paper can be forced by you. So I would want the bank itself to cryptographically sign the data. So, so here's where the thing about uh, trust comes in in the context of digital locker where the data issuer, in this case, the bank signs it with its keys, which the FinTech can verify cryptographically uh, and, and the data flows through and you as an individual has say an access to say uh, give this fintech uh, ability to get this data from this bank uh, or whatever uh, digital locker is kind of this intermediary public storage where you can just pull your data uh, into that place from where you can share so it's uh, in in one way it uses cryptography, but uh, it has got nothing to do with information self-determination, uh, which is why I call digital locker is all about access self-determination. So you can determine who can get access to your data. And of course, that's with the trade-off that the government which operates the locker gets the data in unencrypted form. Uh, so so that's, the, that's the trade-off that you make to uh, do a data exchange between say other entities which are ready to trust a set of you know few entities and not trust people I and mean, this is uh, what i had with locker and trust and do you want to respond to that yeah yeah i mean i understand why they built that uh, locker thing it's never about storage it's about sharing okay and even even on that particular uh, aspect right i mean so you think about it right maybe they just want to share uh, uh, some information uh, about your bank records, right? But 
why share the entire transaction history of where you went and did tarkari shopping right i mean if all the bank really wants to go and share uh, is about what's your average monthly flow that is good enough right and then you come back and say what do i want to share i mean i can come back and say i can you can further apply a transformation for, i mean you can the bank need not actually send uh, i mean the, uh, the the locker itself need not actually store the uh, the uh, the unencrypted form i mean even though it is digitally signed you can still go and uh, you know apply your own encryption key on the digital uh, signature extract out information and say look maybe the statement has x fields i mean it is like 12 month statement maybe i don't want to share all of this maybe these are the things that i applied which is good enough so so the point here is that i mean I, it's kind of understandable what they did with digital locker it is right what he's saying it's fundamentally about you know sharing access control uh, it's never about information self determination but what i'm just trying to tell you is that even on stuff like uh, they, they give you what uh, e a pan nowadays i mean i've seen some of the people uh, coming and giving me e pan as an example uh, even on that right you can apply these things it's not that hard uh, it's just that people have not applied a lot of imagination on it and they just went back and said well earlier you had a physical card and now you have a i mean you had a physical card and a physical statement now you have a, a e card and e statement and just putting a digital signature of the party who's issuing and just giving it to i mean that's basically how i see it yeah but the moment you transform that into a health record i'm now deeply worried because this health record is not about uh, and you applied on health this is not about just a bank statement i mean this is about a whole bunch of other things right there is if i have to do any uh, 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 sharing uh, on uh, digital health it has to be on my control not what the authority on the other side want wanted you know this side one side puts the other side's demands and i'm just basically an intermediary who says yes It, that's not going to work the moment you just transform this architecture into bank i mean uh, into uh, health records ne- not at all and just to add to a comment uh, we are actually in the 2006 of s3 in, in terms of digital locker we still don't have any encryption of that any sorts okay yeah well that's kind of sad no uh, because when people come back and say they are designing 30 year uh, uh, architectures and stuff like that it's kind of interesting that you have to think back and look at what other people made mistakes i mean sri didn't make a mistake they also did what they had to do in order to get the first x number of customers to do it but i'm just saying they went they hit critical adoption only when with the when they added crypto in it and i think it's it's time that we should do that that's basically what i'm saying it's okay for you to start where you started i mean a lot of a lot of a lot of businesses start that way but what you navigate in the middle is what important uh there's one question from pramod uh pramod do you want to take that question ask that question yourself i can allow you to talk you can unmute your mic i uh, you can go ahead and ask the question no problem yeah. okay uh so he, pramod asks how do you think government should participate in creating a public framework around this how do you think government should i mean see, yeah, yeah yeah well government should participate there's no question about it because this is like saying uh, what do they normally do uh, in creating a, a public infrastructure like a road or a airport i mean there is a fixed uh, democratic process they usually follow around it right uh, which is uh, is it necessary is it important what's the standard what is the base minimum thing that you should all follow for and uh, is there something that is going on and then put the standard and uh, then let things evolve because i'm pretty sure the moment they start putting the standard which is much more modern and evolving people will uh, you know sign on to it i think that makes sense um, but uh, the complexity around this uh, much more granular structure that you're proposing could become pretty hard to manage uh, how do you think technology could solve the problem uh so here is what it is right uh you i have about you can you can think of n different ways of doing it right um so if you think about it uh, i mean the, the most interesting thing for me uh is take the simplistic use case of my health record right just look at the fields 
and just tell me what it is. This is not any different than what S3 offers in terms of like a bucket. You just have to basically come back and say, well, it's a document, it's a field, and these are the four or five standard fields. Uh, you can just put a smartphone for it. I mean, for God, I mean, if you know, and, and then go back and say, these are the N encryption algorithms that are standardized, and these are things that you want to just see and you know share it off. So what I'm saying is, in general, these are not complicated problems until uh, once you start going around the path. And then you just have to keep iterating over a period of time to figure out, okay, this is what works, this is what works, this is what works, this doesn't work. It, it, I, I, this is the same uh, model that most of the companies follow in terms of uh, solution iteration. You just have to go back, write a prototype, see how it works, uh, does it make sense, then what's the problem that you have, and, and keep going until you hit uh, what Signal did with the protocol, in the sense that you barely see it, it just works. And then once you come back and say, okay, what's the, what's the most reasonable defaults for it? And you just code up the defaults. I mean, this is what we do all the time, isn't it? When we say we've done all this usability analysis, this is where it works, this is where the maximum thing that comes. And if you're a tweaker, you can just go back to doing more. But if you're a normal person, these are your normal defaults. Sure, yeah. I, I just thought that at the individual level, it's hard to manage. Uh, or even understand how to use it for my own good, right? Even if the frameworks are available. But I think, like you said, it's about a question of iterating to get to the right points. Yeah. I think there was one hand by Konar Modi up. Uh, Konar, do you want to talk? I have unmuted you. Yeah, uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you for your session. I just wanted to take a step back and try and understand. So usually what happens is it's either the right way to do things or the convenient way. And when you start adding all these concerns of encrypting data at rest or sharing data in a, in a differential privacy manner, it, it's adding some sort of burden on, on the organizations. And that's where they decide not to go forward with it maybe the technology is not there or maybe the frameworks are not there. For example, if you're not hosted on Amazon, then doing all this stuff on your own infrastructure in itself is pretty complicated. So where do you see how, how, how can it be like developers are more careful about these things or organizations take it more as a, um, as an important thing to do or a necessary thing to do rather than probably just a legal binding that they have to get through with it. Okay. So this is, the, I mean, this is uh, the free market uh, question, isn't it? In the sense that unless there is a demand, you wouldn't want to do all this because it's too burdensome, right? Uh, so typically what uh, the GDPR approach has been that, look, uh, we are going to force you to follow these rules by just enacting a very broad privacy law. And it, it didn't work very well in my opinion, because if you look at the recent studies that we have been seeing on uh, black, I mean, dark patterns, uh, they just basically convert the entire GDPR into a consent box. I mean, just mandatory keep accept cookies kind of a stuff, right? So the organizational problem would solve when there is widespread awareness about uh, why this is good for business. That is the only way I, which I see it. And they would not be interested in solving these problems until uh, consumers demand it. So that is the demand supply problem. I don't see these problems going away very, very easily. That's my take on it. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I think that's about it. There are no more hands. Uh, okay, does anyone else want to ask questions? Okay, I have one last question, I guess, and we can end it. Um, so there is this whole concept of data trust that's emerging where a lot of uh, organizations are looking at this idea of data fiduciaries where your data is being stored in uh, in a capacity in, in, in say in a digital locker for example and then it will be shared anonymized data will be shared for monetization uh, and there is a lot of talk around this so do you think uh, maybe we can uh, push some of these discussions into that in terms of the whole non-personal data framework that's being debated inside government of India right now, or even part of the uh, privacy bill or the data protection bill? I mean, that is definitely one possibility. And because infrastructures are not made and broken down on well, I mean, the best time is always when they start off doing something new. 
right? I mean, and the more you try to push these discussions, when there is something that is not yet done, the more chance of success you have. Essentially, if one were to build a data trust around this, one could technically do it as a pilot. Yeah. And any data exchange system that's on top of it should be using differential privacy or crypto in some way to enable trust. Correct. Uh, so one major question in all of this, how do you verify it's working? The issue with crypto has always been you, you get an option to verify it, right? Like even S3 or uh, when you share your own keys, you, you can verify it's, it hasn't been tampered with. Yeah. So how, how do you do that with, say, an existing system, especially when the control structures are not with individuals, but it's mostly with, say, government? You can't verify anything. I mean, existing systems are unverifiable by default, and they've been built like that. You just basically have to take it, what, it, what they're telling you on face value and move on. And that's the problem we have, right? That they're fundamentally unverifiable systems, and unverifiable systems are not trustworthy. So if you have to build a trustworthy system, you basically put out the algorithms, you put out the standards, and you put out reference implementations and the source code. I mean, how else would you build public infrastructures? So, so then a better way to push this is actually recommend this as a standard to Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology and to enable these debates there at, at the, within the standards body. Correct. Okay, I think uh, we don't have any more questions. Does anybody have one more last question before we end this? We'll end it at 8.15, considering uh, we're almost done. Okay, I think we can end the session. Thank you, Anand. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for explaining all these individual terms and how, how things need to be built.